your Bibles tonight, let's go back to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. As we've been studying our conduct, the conduct of how we represent Christ in life, we studied on the conduct of a wife in a relationship with her husband, and tonight we'll begin the relationship of a husband with his wife. Between the two passages of Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians chapter 3, they give a glimpse of what God expects in a relationship of a wife and a husband and a husband and wife. Colossians deals with loving our wives, but puts a clause in there and be not bitter against them. Ephesians chapter 5 tells us husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Once again these are two different clauses but very important. Husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That is a sacrificial love. That is going beyond the needling of our wife to be submissive. That is to give and give till it hurts. Husband is commanded to love his wife, no exceptions. Matthew Henry says, loving does not mean liking. And you think about this, as the old timers were used to, many of their marriages were arranged. There was no liking, there was no loving, this was your bride. You had to grow, you had to cultivate the relationship, or you had a very miserable one. Divorce was very much unheard of in the 18th and early 1900s. And many of them were arranged marriage that turned out many, many years, but they learned to love, and he, as he said, not necessarily like. And I was thinking about that. We, we live in a really good society when you think about for a guy and a girl getting someone you don't even know that your parents thought would be a good match for you. And that's what a lot of Christians and a lot of world, they were equally involved in this. And this is where God gave some commands in Ephesians. And he says, we, in his headship, the man is to seek her highest good, not his own welfare. He is to honor her and be considerate of her. And then in Colossians, not to be a bitter against her. When you look at what the Bible says here in verse 18 of chapter 3, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is, all, this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your master according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And the key is this, in whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. Knowing that the Lord, ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Jesus, or the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons." Let's pray tonight. Heavenly Father, we come before you as we open up your word and we look at an important scripture and the responsibilities of the man, the head of the home, the leader of the home, and the responsibilities that fall upon our shoulders to lead our family as Christ leads the church. And Lord, help us to know our place and be proactive in learning our place in our home and what is required of us to make a godly home. Thank you for all you've done for us and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Paul had words for the husband as well. It's funny, a lot of services you see, you see the verses on the wives, but very, very few in-depth messages on the husband. It's almost like what's good for the goose is not good for the gander. 
No, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, and if it cooks the goose, that's fine. And, you know, you look at this, and we want to skip around what's in hurts. And the reason is, a lot of us are not doing what we should be doing, period. As I mentioned in Amos, this morning in Bible study, is how guilty are we when God judges the nation of Israel and Judah for not keeping His commandments? When we think about His Word, it's full of commandments. And the problem is, we as Christians want to pick and choose. As I've heard in, in my seminary classes and messages, we're cherry-picking Christians. We pick the best ones for us. We don't have the option. We don't have the luxury to pick and choose from God what we want to do and what we don't want to do. The same way with marriages. If we are to have a godly marriage, the wife is to do her part, the husbands do their part, the children do their part, and then we have four have a godly home. But we cannot pick and choose, wife do what she wants and guys don't know what we want. It doesn't work that way. And it's a constant working because all parties have the flesh involved. All parties have pride. All parties have self-will. Therefore, it's going to be an issue with dying to self. But Paul had words. And he says, husbands love your wife and be not bitter against them. It may also have been true that Christian men used to the Roman custom of giving unlimited power to the head of the family were not used to treating their wives with respect and love and courtesy. But as they got saved, Paul began to teach the Colossae church, I'm glad you're here, but here is what God wants from you. Forget what the man in the world wants. What does God as a Christian want from you? What, as a Christ-like follower, what does he want from you? Real spiritual leader will be a servant. This is what we see in our Christian circles, which is sad. Servitude among leadership is obsolete. I've been to churches where we're training servants for the master. I've been to places where we have the servant's heart. And my wife and I have walked in there going, where? Didn't see it. We see self-serving. We see self-gratifying. We see this. And when I've been to a lot of churches in my life, and if you're going to put it on your bulletin board, if you're going to put it on your bulletins, if you're going to put it on the signs, you better do it. Because if not, you're a hypocrite. And people see right through it. But this is what it is. I've been in university. And some of the pastors and teachers, they're with the Lord now. They've been a part of churches where I'm the head tater, don't question me. It's like, well, where's that in the Bible? Where's the Bible that the pastor is untouchable? Where's it that he is in the, as one professor of mine laughed, he goes, yeah, many of you guys are going to get in your pulpit and you're going to descend from the heavenlies before service and arise back to the heavenlies without touching the common folk. <laughs> and he made fun of it. He said, because that's what a lot of pastors do. Don't touch me. I'm busy. You know, I'll greet you and walk out the door as I'm going. Half the time I don't get to greet with you because I'm having the fellowship of talking with someone and I'm giving them my time. I've been in places where leadership doesn't give them the time. But I've been in homes where husbands won't give their wives any time. Except, I need some sandwich. I need a coffee. I need this. I need that. Well, well wait a minute. Where's the slave bondage? Did, did I see an all through her ear somewhere? We live in a society where she's not our slave. As I've told people many, many times, if Christ wanted the woman a slave, he would made her out of the heel bone to be under our foot. But he made her out of the rib, the very rib that protects the most important part of a man, the heart. We are help meets, not servants, not slaves. I laughed. I was not raised in the South. I was raised in the Pacific Northwest. My dad was an army cook for many years. And I remember my dad getting up many times. Mom was sick. He's making pancakes. He was doing things. And we always had a good laugh at him. Because he would put on mom's apron. It never fit. 
But he's like, I'm the cook and the bottle washer today. If you don't like it, you can eat off the floor. You know, dad was always doing stuff. And even now, my dad still cooks dinner when mom's not feeling well. He's 90 years old. It may be a pizza in a box, but he's still in the kitchen doing something, amen? But the thing is, and I moved down the States and the South, the mentality for men is a little different. You got to get up. You got to make my lunch. You got to do this. You got to do that. I worked with a bunch of guys and said, yeah, my wife got up at such and such a time to make me lunch. So what's wrong with you, lazy? I never, I work construction and I got up early. I never woke my wife up to make my breakfast, lunch, dinner, make tea, do anything like that. I did it myself. You know, the thing is, that's selfish. God never made us that way. And you know what the Bible says? Love, Christ, love as Christ loved the church. God does not demand our service. God does not make us do things. He wants us to do it out of love. You look at life. How do I expect? This is something that we as a husband and wife are teams. If my wife is sick... I don't make her get out of bed and make lunch and dinner or nothing like that. We got a family to do so. If she's up and I'm making a cup of coffee, I make sure she has a nice fat free hot chocolate with very little bit of whipped cream on top. <clears throat> now she's got a Starbucks mug about that big and the whipped cream's over top, you know. You know, she's always laughing at me, you're not helping my weight any. You look fine to me. <laughs> you know. But the thing is, you be that person that you would want happen to you. And this is where Paul is dealing. He says, now guys, you're in the Christian realm. You're in the servant realm. Just as Christ served the disciples, even to the point of washing their feet, so the husband is to serve his wife. This means putting aside his own interests in order to care for his wife's needs and emotions. A wise and Christ-honoring husband will not abuse his leadership role and become a dictator in an ungodly minion of all sorts at the same time a wise and Christ honoring wife will not try to undermine her husband's leadership and become nitpicking critical and badgering either approach causes disunion friction in marriage you know I found that interesting because that comes from the 1600 what has it changed? Guys can be self-serving, can be abusive of their leadership role, and wives can be on the flip side, nitpicking, critical. This is something we all can be that way. Husbands, I've seen husbands pick on their wives' weight, their wives' looks, where wives at, and I'm looking at the husband and going, if you looked in the mirror, <laughs> that's the pot calling the kettle black. And have you ever seen a lot of southern boys? They love their fried chicken. So they're, they're calling their wives heavy, and I'm looking at myself and going, shut up. <laughs> you know, but I see this, and I'm like, really? And then I've seen Christian wives sit there and tear their husbands apart, left, right, and center in front of the whole church. I'm thinking to myself, and the husband's just taking it laughing, but I know inside he's breaking. We are not to be that thorn in each other's flesh. Be not bitter against what would make a husband bitter against his wife? Well, what couldn't? If he could never do anything right? If he could never be good in her eyes? Or if he doesn't like something about her? The word bitter, and I'm going to focus on this, in, this, this evening. The duty of the husband is to show affection toward the wife at all times. The affection is to be genuinely manifested it says, husband, love your wives. Second of all, his affection is to be free from all harshness and criticism. And as I look at this, these two things I'm going to focus on tonight. Number one, how genuine is our love? Love is not, and Matthew Henry says, marriage is not based on our first years. We are all different people. I was young and immature. I was laughing with my brother this week. His wife posted pictures of him when they were first married and wishing him happy uh, birthday. And of course, he's in his 60s. And so during business meeting on Zoom, 
I put his picture on Facebook and put it right in my camera. I says, has anybody seen this man? He goes, I haven't seen that man in years. He had so much hair, I don't know what I did with all of it. <laughs> you know, we're younger. He was athletic. He was a basketball player. He's in his 60s now. He's not what he was in the 20s. I'm not what I was in the 20s. And he goes, I seem to remember you used to have hair too. And I said, yes, I did. It left me a long time ago. I had a lot of hair. But it went when I combed it back and went out with me. <laughs> you know, we're not what we were in our 20s. I was immature. I was irresponsible. I was a lot of things. We're growing. We're different now. But I know many marriages that hold 20, 30 years ago still against their spouses. What a shame. You haven't learned to grow together instead of growing apart. The affection is to be genuinely manifested. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Obligation is not an all one-sided wife servitude marriage. If it is, my personal opinion, and this is my personal opinion, if your wife is your slave, you're a louse. I'm just going to call it like it is. You're a lazy louse. Because I've watched my father time and time again serve my mother. I do things, not all the things I should do, but I have fun doing things. We work together as a team. She's not my slave. The husband is not less bound to discharge his duty to his wife than the wife to him. Love is the sum of the husband's duty that will regulate every other. Charles Spurgeon says, one may say they love the wife, but their love will reflect their actions. Love one, one may say they love their wife, but love will be reflected in their actions. If they love you, they're not going to expect more than they would expect of themselves. You know, love is cheap. I was walking down the store the other day, picking up something, and these two kids going, love you. I want to go. Pfft. Love is not what a word says. Are you, and I almost want to say, is she the flavor of the month, kid? <laughs> you know, love, you have no idea what love is. Love is still getting in bed going, why did I even get married? Will you ever say that? Mm -hmm. You probably will. I've been married 29 years and sometimes I wonder, what did I do? <laughs> because you know what? We get selfish. We do. We wonder what's going on in life. But here's the thing. People say love, 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 love. But how do you treat her? How do you treat your family? When love rules, the family circle becomes a tranquil and cherished haven of rest, peace, harmony, and joy. When love rules, no one will want to leave the home for any other enjoyment, for the home is the enjoyment. Nor is it enough that this affection should be recognized as a matter of course, but a manner of manifestation. When there is true love in a home, I had so many people tell me, I am ready to get out of my house. I could stay in my house all the time and never have a problem. Is it always good? No. I get irritating. My wife gets irritating. The kids get irritating. But we get over it. We, ir we irritate each other to the point where we're laughing again and have a good life. But you know what? We're human. Nothing's going to be perfect but your house should be as perfect as can be. That woman, many look as a strange, heartless shrew who is unaffected by gentle evidences of devoted and manly love. But guess what? Why so? You ought to ask yourself, if you're doing what we should do, why is somebody that way? Now, I know I've counseled enough people Sometimes people cannot change. And I say that in a very tongue-in-cheek. They will not change. They're set in their ways. And no matter what you do to them, they're never going to change. God can change them, but that's up to them. Does that change you? No. Still be that person that loves. Like going back to Matthew Henry. Didn't say like them. It says love them. And that's the world we have to like, the Bible says love our neighbor as ourself. Never says like him. It says love him. 
you can love someone without liking them. Because if we had to like some of our neighbors, we wouldn't do so well. The Bible says love them. Love is an action. And as we look at the Word of God, when love rules, there will be a manifestation of Christ in the home. The true wife, every woman craves for appreciation. They crave to be accepted. They crave to be loved. They crave to be cherished. Let the husband show the same tender consideration regarding to his wife as life advocates and cares multiply as when he stood by her side by side at the altar. A lovely confiding bride looking for acceptance and a place of security. A wife needs and that's what Peter said. Peter says to love your wives for they're the weaker vessel. You are to be the protector of her from life's problems. You are to be that man that is her shield. As Song of Solomon says, the buckler, the high tower. You are to be that person. But on the flip side too, let's go to the other thing. Sometimes the wife wants to supersede that. You look in homes today and I see a home ruled entirely by the mom. And the daughters take that trait and they become that same domineering nitpicking ugly woman and let's be honest that's not become a woman to be the leader of the home it's a monster out of the cage as one of my professors used to say Proverbs talks about a cantankerous woman when you don't do what a domineering demanding woman does it literally as Dr. Siler says hell on earth and folks it is true I'll never forget some of the classes he taught and his words he used to us men about what happens when somebody usurps the authority of the Bible he said your marriage can be heaven on earth or it can be a foretaste of hell on earth it can be a miserable miserable place he said the amount of smiles and giggles and facades you can put will never be the truth. If the husband is not the man God created him to be and the wife is not the wife there will never be a unity no matter how much we say is all's good and he really or she loves me. He said you're living a lie in a dream world that doesn't exist. And I see that in marriages all over. There's a lot of lies in marriages. You could see it with the eyes. A true wife will not need to tell anybody she's loved. A true wife will not te- need to tell anybody how much she's needed. It will show. A true husband will not need to brag about his wife. A true husband will not need to prop his wife up in an imaginary world. It will be seen. When you look at this, actions speak louder than words. You don't have to tell everybody, I have a wonderful marriage. You may say that, but you don't need to brag about something you already have. You just live in it. And I see a lot of people telling about their marriages and, and then I'll just kind of step back and I wonder if that's really the truth. Affection is to be genuinely manifested. And genuinely manifested love for the Lord, you don't have to tell somebody. People tell me all the time over the 17 years, of oh, pastor, I pray for you every day. You don't need to tell me that because it's probably not true because I'll be honest, I don't pray for you all every day. And I'd be lying if I said I did. Why? Because I'm still human. I get running the rat race of things and I'm like, oh, bless the church. And other days, I will get there. And if you do, praise the Lord. But that's far, few and far between to be like my grandmother who prayed, getting up 4, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning and praying all day. You know, you think about this. We don't all read our Bibles every day as we should. If we do, it's a snippet. We don't all study. 
It's best not say it and make a hypocrite out of ourselves. It's best not to say, I live a godly life because, folks, we are not all living the godly life that we should because there's always another bar higher. We need to be real Christians. We need to be striving for the things of God, not bragging about the things we're not striving for. I'm not here to make a liar out of myself and set myself up on the pedestal. But when we brag about, oh, what a godly marriage we have, or what a godly spouse we have, and all this other stuff, oh, they're so... Facebook is the biggest lying platform I've ever seen. It really is. I watch pastor's wives and pastor's husband, uh, pa uh, pastors and pastor's wives, Christians that I know, and they're bragging about their life, and I'm like, barf bag, please. This come with the barf bag on here? They're lying. And I know that because I know their inner working, but people don't know that. So they're posting all these flowery things and their spirituality and, oh, this message is so great. And that message, if you'd li listen to the message and actually believe it, you'd be a good person. But don't try to convince me of your lies because you're trying to convince yourself of your own lies. As I said this morning in Amos, do you notice that? They were convincing themselves of the lies. Folks, we live in a facade of a world that we're always pasting stuff that's really not our life because that's what we want. But we're not striving for it. If you want a godly marriage, roll up your sleeve and work at it. If you want a godly, be a godly husband, work up, do it. If you want to have a godly uh, relationship between husband and wife and wife and husband, you got to work at it. It's a two-sided street. Many say, well, I'll do this once my husband does that. Or I'll do this once my wife does that. Nowhere in the Bible. If that was what Christ would not even come to the cross. Because how many people reciprocate his love? How many reciprocate his service? Not very many. So Christ says, well, if the church loves me as he should, then I'll come die for them. <laughs> he would have never come die for us. We would have been up a creek without a paddle. But why do we put stipulations? If they do this, I'll do that. Where's that in the Bible? Please, chapter and verse, I'd like to know. It's not. As I mentioned this morning about the wife, her husband didn't come to the Lord until she stood up and became the Christian she should be. This is the problem. Until we become the Christian we should be, we're not going to be the light we should be. We're not going to be the influence we should be. We need to be the leaders of the home. We need the husbands to show tender, considerate, affection, understanding, and strength, and security to the wife. But what the wife is missing today is stability and security. You think about this. All women want to be loved. If it wasn't so, Hallmark would not be a channel. If it wasn't so, you wouldn't walk down Walmart and see a ton of dime store romance novels. They want this love. They crave for it. They can be the biggest feminist. They can be the biggest macho feminist. They, are really, they still want to be loved. If you didn't believe it, we wouldn't be having this type of month celebrating sin. If they don't find it from a man, they'll find it from someone. They want to be cherished. God created them that way. And men, let's be honest, 99% of us, there are some guys that God said are born without that affection. But 99% of us guys, we can't live without a wife. We want that companionship. We want that understanding. You know what guys need most? And I'm figuring out more and more and more. If it wasn't for my wife's affirmation in a lot of things, I've learned I live for it. I want her approval. If she doesn't say I do a good job in the message, I wonder if I did or not. If she doesn't correct me in my message, I know she wasn't listening and she was back there sleeping. But you know, I, I look for that. I look for job well done. That's what parents do. That's what guys do. They want that kind affection. If you're doing a good job, thank you.
this. Just as a wife wants the affection, wants the appreciation, wants the doting, wants the security. God created the wife to be protected. And this is the thing where our world has turned that all up and we've created monsters out of the cages. Men are feminized, women are masculine. That just doesn't fit. That doesn't fit God's plan. That does not fit the creation. You can call yourself whatever you want, but we're still who God created us. This affection is to be genuinely manifested in our hearts. Second of all, this affection is to be free from harshness. And the Bible says, be not bitter against them. It is implied that the love of a Christian heart may be marred by a sour and cantankerous and an inflictive temper. It is ungenerous and cruel to vent upon a woman and family the anger which the man had not the courage to display before those who roused it with mixing among them in the world. Bitterness may be manifested by such a cold, repulsive silence as by the most stinging words of sharp and angry reproof or by the irritating actions of a willful and tantalizing conduct. It is a man who learns to hold his peace when he's being belittled, when he's being cut down. It is a man who lives in a world that belittles and cuts him down that holds his temper from taking out on his wife. It can be both ways. We do not bring our problems and take the anger out on our family. We do not, no matter how bad our wife treats us, gentlemen, God says be not bitter against them. This is angry, malicious, and retaliatory. Christ is not that way. Christ said, Father, forgive them when they brutally beat him and crucified him. We have to have that forgiving heart no matter what they do. We are not to be given the right to be retaliatory. We're not to be given the right to treat them as a slave and a servant. If you do, God help you. That's not what Christ intended. She is not your slave. She is not your possession. She is your helpmate. Bitterness may be manifested in many ways. Resentment, revenge are not to be part of a marriage. It is a species of savage and fiendish brutality for a husband to study how he can inflict the keenest torture on a loving, submissive nature that God instilled upon a woman. It is fiendish to take upon a woman's desire to please and make her into a slave with no willpower. It is sometimes required to be forceful but is never required to be ugly. There's a difference of being asserting to say, no, honey, this is what we're doing. You are the man of the home. But to be ugly in doing so is wrong. It is never to be done in violence. It is never to be done in derogatory. But there are times when men need to put their foot down because they are the man. They do and given by God the responsibility to lead the home and they will give account for the home. But many men will say, all right, honey, we'll do what you want to do. A woman is ruled by emotions, but a woman also has some keen sense God has given her. But there ought to be a balance. There are some times when emotions need to be overruled by rational thinking. God knows that. But there are times that as a partner, you think and work together as one. Listening to each other's advice and making the decision wholly together. It is never to be used as a dictatorial. It is to be free from harshness. 
amid the perplexities and trials of a married life, many occasions will arise in which mutual patience and forbearance will need to be greatly exercised. Let love reign supreme and banish the first symptoms of a harsh and curlish disposition. The instructions for the wife are addressed to her will. The instructions to the husband are addressed to his heart. He is to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. The word used for love is agape, the highest form of love, the very love of God. It is the Calvary love. Husbands are not to become bitter toward their wives. The word used means to exasperate, to irritate, to make bitter, to anger, to insult. It is used elsewhere in the New Testament only in the Apocalypse, in the book of Revelation, where it's used to describe the effect that Satan will have on human life and society when he's finally cast down to let loose his wrath upon man. Think about that. God used the same word. Do you think Satan cares about mankind? Absolutely not. But think about this word that means to exasperate, to irritate, to make bitter, to anger. Intentionally stirring the wife up. Not a good thing. How do you do that? Charles Finney says, a good way to a wife's anger is treat her like a subordinate with no feelings. Yeah, you want to make a wife mad? Treat her like a slave. She may never say it in person, but what you're doing is degrading the person God made her. Because let's be honest, guys, we all up married. Our wives are better at us. They can multitask. I have a one train track that crashes all the time. It's always a dead end and a bridge somewhere. But each one of us make the marriage. And as Charles Finney put it, we've got to be careful. Husbands, the word is also used to describe the effect that a certain little book had on John when he obeyed the angel's command to eat it. It was in my mouth, sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, he said it was bitter. We must avoid allowing the kind of bitterness to sour our marriage because that is the devil's mix to ruin a love toward each other. Most of us will have irritating traits that ask, exasperate others. Unless we deal with them, these traits within the narrow walls of the home can become destructive and turn the marriage into what John calls wormwood. The irritating things may be big or little, but we need to be mindful of our traits, both husband and wife, to make sure they're not the fuse that lights the stick of dynamite. Be careful. There is not one of us that does not have an irritating trait to someone else. Let's not build on it and use it. I know, guys, we like to poke bears, but your wife is not the one to poke. Because as my dad had the sign on the fridge one year, he bought mom a magnet, said, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And that is so true. If a wife is not happy, the whole home will know it. And you'll be stepping on glass the whole day or the whole week, or the whole month, depending on how long she takes it. And that's what the Bible says. It's better to dwell on the corner of a housetop than in the house with a cantank cantankerous, irritating woman. Or irritated woman. We must avoid, at all costs, that kind of bitterness. The devil wants to sour our marriage. A sneering attitude by one partner a belittling word toward the other partner's looks, interest, emotional or physical desires will ruin a person's whole life. You know, you hear that stupid thing, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can't hurt me. Most marriages are living in a physical or non-physical emotional and verbal abuse. What's worse? 
I would rather somebody hit me than somebody cut me down with words. I could take a punch, but I can't take a constant belittling of my character. That destroys who I am. That will destroy who you are. You can lie to yourself. We can, I can lie to myself that it doesn't bother me. I'm a big boy. I've got big shoulders, but it hurts. My wife will tell you that all the years of all the letters I've read, each letter stings anew from members. It hurts because I know what I have done. I know, and this is the thing in life. We have to realize that words hurt. We're all just tender, mushy bears, and words hurt us. And for men to use their words against their wives and wives to use their words against their men, it's wrong. No wonder marriages become powder kegs. Don't become bitter, the Bible says. We must avoid. On the other hand, we need to be careful of the minor irritants. As, Song, as Solomon says, little foxes that spoil the grapes. Husbands, love your wife as yourself and as Christ loved the church. And be not bitter, harsh, rigorous, either in spirit, word, or deed, which by many case it is manifest in anger. Paul tells us to cultivate a sweet, loving, tender spirit. Peter gives a similar advice. Consider your wives as weaker vessels. Perhaps Peter was thinking of his own wife and his own home way back in Capernaum. He would remember the day when he invited the Lord into his home. The Lord had responded by working a miracle of healing his mother-in-law. It would seem that thereafter the Lord made Peter's home his home for the duration of his Galilean ministry. Such is the blessing that comes from any home as a Christ-centered home when God is invited in. Paul adds that a wife should submit herself to the husband because it is fit in the Lord. The word means to be fitting. The word suggests arriving at or reaching a goal. He then commands the husband to love sacrificially and to be mindful of his attitude toward her. Sadly, a lot of men need to have a lesson in love. A lef lesson in cherishment. A lesson in respect. There's not a perfect marriage out there. There's a growing in every marriage. But as we recap, simply from this tiny little verse, what can we learn? They must love with tender and faithful affection as Christ loved the church and as their own bodies and even as themselves. With a love that is unique to the nearest relationship and the greatest comfort of the blessing of life taught by Christ himself. We must not be bitter against them not use them unkindly, not treat them or belittling their creative spirit with a harsh language or severe treatment, but be kind, obliging in all things. For the woman was made for the man. Neither is the man without the woman, and the man also is by the woman. The woman was never made to be used by the man in a derogatory form. When you look at all what God says, God wants us as men to treat our wives with the love and cherishment that he treats us. The wives are to serve and love the husbands that is fitting to the Lord. It is a double-edged sword. One is not to do less than the other. It is swings both ways. That's why the Bible says it's a two-edged sword. When God swings one way, he's going to be coming back the other. So when we can say, oh, the wife, but wait a minute, it's about to swing back your way. It is an equal responsibility in the marriage to give it all to each other. This is the thing where God tells so many times we're not to defraud each other in areas of intimacy. 
We're to pray for each other. We're not to be mad at each other. We're not to let the anger go down on our wrath. There is so, or the sun go down on our wrath. There are so many things in the Bible that God gives little snippets for both sides. And it's sad when most churches only focus on the woman's point of view. God gives more responsibility to the guy because sacrificial love goes far beyond submissive love. It goes beyond so many things. When you look at what the Bible says, one of the great things in God's word, we'll notice God saying, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. We do not do things for our wives because it benefits us. It is doing anything as unto the Lord. Wives, same things. Whatsoever you do heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. Knowing that the Lord, ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. God's not just talking to the man. God's not talking to the woman. He's talking to the servant. He's talking to the ch children. Everything we do, we remember we're serving Christ. Everything. Is that how we treat Christ? Is that how we expect from Christ? But a lot of times Christians treat Christ as a lucky rabbit's foot. You only pull them out in the time of need. As one of my professors, Dr. Clark, used to say, wasn't so lucky for the rabbit who lost his foot. You know, they carried this lucky rabbit foot. That wasn't a lucky rabbit. He lost his foot. But guess what? We have to be careful. God never made us to where we are demanding service of others. Because God demands service of us all. We are to have the servant's heart in everything we do. Don't just put it on a bulletin. Put it on your steering wheel. Be a servant just live like Christ is follow Christ in all you do and guess what it will come the closer we get to Christ we'll be more like Christ follow me as I follow Christ Paul said in God's word there is so much about submission and there is so much about love but if you ever notice what God says about love we're to love God first with all our heart all our soul and all our mind and love our neighbor as ourself. You know who is our neighbor? Our wife. Our children. Anyone that is close. If we're to put them first. We have to love them. The only way we can love them. Like we should. Is we have to love God like we should. Christ's love. Is a deep agape love. It's a Calvary love. It's a sacrificial love. We want godly marriages. It begins with a man. A man has to become the man God created him to be. Don't be afraid of who God says a man is. I know the world doesn't like that. We're labeled a few things, but I don't care what the world, what does the Bible said? We don't do it as pleasing men. You're not going to stand before them, ever. You're going to stand before God. We ought to be the men I've heard people, well, I can't change. I grew up that way. That's an excuse. Everybody can change. Like I said, my uncle grew up in an alcoholic, abusive home. And he was the most gentle person I ever met. He did not become an alcoholic. He became a chocoholic. He says, I had to have a habit, so I chose a habit that was good for me. Not really. <laughs> he always had a Hershey bar somewhere. That was his thing. But he was the kindest, gentlest person I ever met. I loved him very much. He was one of a kind. And guess what? If he told you the stories, one summer I had the privilege of working with him on his hot dog stand in the park in Portland, Oregon. I think I ate all the profits. <laughs> he used to laugh at me, get away from the hot dogs. Well, these are good, Uncle Don. But he shared with me what a life he had. I can't imagine being beat regularly 
with a broom handle by a drunken father. But you know what? He loved his dad. He prayed for his dad. You think about what life is like. He says, I chose to be better than what I was rose. It's an excuse when we say, well, I, I, you know, it's the way I grew up. Hey, everybody changes. And that's what God says. I can do all things. You want to be the husband you need to be? You can change if you want to be. You want to be the wife that God wants you to be? You can be if you want to be. It all starts here. The will. Do we want to be what God wants us to be? Are we doing it as unto the Lord? Are we doing it begrudgingly because we have to? There's a different service. We go to church because we have to. We got to. Or we go to church because we want to and love to. There's a difference. It will be reflective in our worship. It will be reflective in our life. We go to work because we have to make some money or we go to work because we get to go to work and we have a job. There's a difference. Even the worst of jobs, even the worst of lives, we can find the best of living because we're doing it under the Lord. May God help us. Husbands, love your wives. It's not an option. It's a command. And love is not a word. It's an action. How do we love our wives? How do they know we love them? We're not perfect by any shape or form. But how do they know? If we were gone, what will they miss about us? What will they remember about us? As we think about them, what will we miss in love about them? I think about that when I was listening to the funeral as the granddaughter was sharing some things about the grandmother what are we leaving behind for them to miss husbands and wives how will we be missed or will we be like whew, they're gone you think about this there are some people that are happy their spouses die if it is you don't have the right marriage if you're going to miss something it literally be missed and there will be something that will be left behind that will never be filled May we show the love on both sides that God wants us to do. May we show the commitment God wants for a marriage. May we show the submission. And the Bible says, submit yourselves one to another. Before it says, wife, submit yourself to the husband. Everything God wants is that submissive heart to him. And to the rest will fall in place. If we love God, and we submit to God, our whole attitude and outlook will be different. Let's pray tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessing. Thank you for our spouses. And Lord, we ask you that you'd raise up more Christian spouses, more Christian men and women, willing to take on the challenge of God's word, to have that marriage that is a little bit of heaven, a home that no one wants to leave. A life, even in the midst of hardship, personality traits, it's still a place desired to be. Thank you for all you've done for us, Lord. Thank you for all that you're going to do. And Lord, I ask you that you'd help us as husbands and as men to be the man you'd have us be. As wives and ladies of the church, help us to be the spouses you'd have us be. And Lord, as we look at the word of God, we do everything as unto you. May you be pleased with how we treat the one you gave us to. Thank you for all you've done. Dismiss with your blessing. Be with the ones not feeling well. And Lord, be with those that are traveling today. May they arrive safely. And Lord, thank you for all you've done for us. Give us safety on our way home. Bring us back on Wednesday at 7 o'clock as we open up thy word again. In Jesus' precious and wonderful name, amen. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Lord bless, you're dismissed.